Hi, everyone, and welcome to episode 184 of the Medieval Podcast. I'm Danielle Sobolski, also known as the 5-Minute Medievalist. Now, if you've noticed that my sound is a little bit different today, that is because I'm actually recording not in my little studio, but at my desk. I don't know if I mentioned this on the podcast earlier, but just before Christmas, I adopted a new puppy named Apollo, and he's only three and a half months old. And if you've had a dog or a puppy before, you know that it's a lot like having a toddler in the house. and You kind of have to work around them in a lot of ways. And today I have not managed to get him to go for his nap, but it's time to record because I didn't want to leave you without an episode. So if you've noticed the sound quality is a little bit different today, this is because I'm using my very old, old school rig from the beginning of the podcast sitting at my desk. You're probably going to hear a puppy in the background, but that is just how it's going to go because one of the lessons I've had to learn in my life is that done is better than perfect. And I'm hoping that my imperfection sometimes serves to give you permission to be imperfect as well. So with all of that said, we're going to get into today's podcast episode. I've been thinking a lot about saints lately, and it could be because, as I said to one of my kids just the other day, you never see a saint with a puppy. (laughs) You, You may often see a saint with older dogs, but not usually with puppies because they certainly can try your patience. So I've been thinking about saints. And when I'm doing this podcast, I'm always trying to think about ways to serve people, to help people understand the Middle Ages better. And of course, saints are a huge part of the culture of the Middle Ages. So today I'm going to give you a quick introduction to some of the most popular saints that you may come across when you're studying the Middle Ages, just to give you a little bit of an introduction so that you can spot them if you see them around. So today, Apollo and I are going to give you a beginner's guide to saints in the Middle Ages, and it's coming up right after this. I want to start off this episode by saying that there are a lot of people that still venerate saints today, and this episode is by no means a criticism of them or of saints in general. This is just my perspective on what I've seen in the research about saints in the Middle Ages. So just full disclosure, I'm not a Catholic. I did go to Sunday school as a kid, so I have a little bit of background on some of these figures, but I'm looking at this from a historian's perspective, and by no means is this an invitation for me or anybody else to criticize saints and people's beliefs about them. So I just want to get that out up front. So many times you hear medievalists, including me, talk about saints and the stories of saints as being vaguely comparable to superheroes today. And again, this isn't meant to denigrate saints, but it's kind of the closest thing that we can get to a comparison these days. And I will tell you why. All of these saints in the Middle Ages have their own origin stories, how they became saints. They have their own symbols. So it's the same as walking through a store today. You recognize this symbol means Superman. This symbol means Black Panther. This symbol means Wonder Woman. It's very much the same when you look at iconography of saints in the Middle Ages. They all have symbols so that you can see who you're looking at and understand the story right away. They also have stories in which they are fighting evil. So this is something that our superheroes have in common with medieval saints. They often make mistakes and are redeemed and... The other thing that makes it similar to superheroes, I think, is that everybody has a favorite. And I guarantee I'm going to forget somebody's favorite today because there are literally hundreds of saints out there, major biblical figures, angels, also local saints, ones that we know historically were real people, ones that we're not sure are real people. So hundreds of saints and everybody had a favorite. The major role of saints in the Middle Ages was to be intercessors between people, so sinners, and God. So a lot of people didn't feel that they could actually speak to God or to Jesus directly. It would be easier for them to speak to a saint instead. Many of the stories of the saints are told and retold to the point at which they have other legends that have grown up around them, including the original legend. There are layers upon layers of stories that are added, and At the same time, you also have stories of saints that have been kind of told to the point at which they have eroded a little bit so that they have the same shape. And again, this is something that I think is very similar to our superhero stories today. There are definitely distinct differences between, for example, Superman and Black Panther, but the origin stories have a certain shape to them. You can probably hear Apollo in the background right now walking around. I'm sure he is just as fascinated by medieval saints as I am. 
<laughs> Maybe not. So when it comes to the stories of the saints, when I talk about them being kind of eroded to have the same shape, many stories of saints, which are called hagiographies, have the same shape in that they start with somebody in the distant past, usually the Roman Empire. They start off pagan or they start off as young Christians. They explore their faith. If they are pagan at first, they convert. And then they preach a lot or they do good works that draw attention so that a lot of people are paying attention to their Christianity. And this becomes threatening to the king or the emperor or whoever is in charge of this pagan land. They are obstinate in the face of the pagan culture in which they live. They convert others either actively or passively, and then they're usually taken captive. They are put to interrogation. They are put to torture. Some of this is pretty graphic. In fact, it's usually pretty graphic. And then they are martyred. The difference between male saints and female saints in the Middle Ages is there is often an element of virginity or marriage that's happening in stories of female saints. I don't think this is a surprise to anybody. <laughs> I told you it's like having a toddler in the background <laughs> digging in his crate right now. Okay, so now that we've got the basic shape of a saintly life or a hagiography in the bag, and I've given the dog a bone to chew on so I can get this podcast recorded, let's get into some specific saints because I think this is the interesting stuff. I've done a couple of podcasts in which I talked with my guests about how iconography can help People who are literate especially look to the outside of a church or even look at a picture and understand what they're looking at and remember the story of a certain saint. So let's get into some particular saints who you might recognize or will recognize from now on when you see them in medieval iconography. So the first category I'm going to start with is the biblical saints. And I think that it's appropriate to start with St. Michael. St. Michael is an archangel, so he's at the top of the angelic pyramid. He is supposed to be one of the protectors of heaven. He's usually seen with a flaming sword and he is the one who is attributed to being the angel that kicked Adam and Eve out of the garden of Eden. So you'll see St. Michael evoked if somebody needs protection. If you see a flaming sword, that's usually St. Michael. Of course, he's got, always got wings and he's always got a halo because he is an archangel. And I might be misremembering this, but when I went to Le Mont Saint-Michel in France, I believe that that abbey, that monastery was built on that island in part because St. Michael came to someone in a dream with his flaming sword and touched it to the head of the person who had this revelation and decided they were going to build there. So his flaming sword is a big part of St. Michael's iconography. I mentioned St. Michael and not all the other archangels today because Michael Mass or Michael Mass is an important day that was noted by people in medieval Europe. So I figure St. Michael is somebody that we should know. His day, Michael Mass or Michael Mass, is September 29th. Another biblical figure who you should probably know and will recognize, and probably he's one that, of all of these people, you might recognize most readily, and that is St. Peter. St. Peter is recognized because he has a key almost always. Jesus said Peter was the rock on which he was going to build his church. He gave Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And so St. Peter is the one who is carrying the keys around, and he is the one that you will meet at the pearly gates if and when you get there, he is the one who has the keys to heaven. So if you see somebody with keys, that is St. Peter, not St. Peter the martyr, who is another guy completely. The next biblical saint who you will come across quite a lot if you keep studying the Middle Ages is Mary Magdalene. And Mary Magdalene in the Middle Ages is the grouping together of two figures in the Bible the one who washes the feet of Jesus and the one who is formerly a sex worker. So Mary Magdalene is thought of as being both of these things at the same time, even though there is a case to be made if you actually read the Bible very carefully, that these are actually two separate people. In the Middle Ages, they're thought of as one person. And there's a whole legend that grows up around the story of Mary Magdalene. It involves her traveling to Marseille. It involves her growing hair all over her body. And so if you see a saint that has her body completely covered with hair, that could be Mary Magdalene. Another clue would be she has a pot of ointment with her. This is an absolutely massive legend. And my good friend and mentor, Joanne Finden, 
wrote a whole book about the Digby Mary Magdalene play. And on the front cover of that, you can see the picture of Mary Magdalene just completely covered in hair and levitating with ships and an ocean behind her. It's really kind of interesting how much her story became embellished from the very small bits and pieces that are found in the Bible. Another biblical figure who you might come across as a saint in the Middle Ages is Thomas. Saint Thomas was one of Jesus' disciples, and he's the one called Doubting Thomas, who wasn't sure that it actually was Jesus who was resurrected. So Thomas can be found with a carpenter square because he is said to have been building churches. And again, this is not in the Bible, although Thomas is mentioned in the Bible as being the doubting one. He also might be represented by a spear, which was the way in which he was martyred. But I mentioned Thomas here because there are many St. Thomases and they all have different iconography. So if you see one with a carpenter square, that's St. Thomas the Apostle. If you see one with a sword or actively getting his head cut, that is Thomas Becket, who was martyred in the 12th century. He is the one that Henry II said, will no one rid me of this turbulent priest? and ended up martyred because of that. Although I think Henry denied that himself. He apologized for that later. St. Thomas the Apostle is also not Thomas Aquinas, who was another medieval saint who was represented by a sun on his chest, or sometimes it's described as a star, which is the light and knowledge that he brought because Thomas Aquinas, of course, is somebody who wrote a lot of theological texts. Speaking of people who wrote theological texts and was also revered as a saint, we have Paul, who is the person who wrote all of those letters in the New Testament. So Ephesians, Corinthians, this is Paul's writing. So if you are a woman who has a little bit of a beef about how women are meant to be members of the family or members of the congregation, chances are that your beef is with Paul. You can recognize St. Paul because he often has a sword, which was the method of his martyrdom, or he has a book because, as we know, St. Paul was a guy who wrote a lot of things, for better and for worse. His writing was taken in all sorts of different directions by theologians since it was written back in the day. So speaking of Thomas Aquinas and St. Paul brings me to the church fathers who are also often depicted in medieval art, one of these being St. Jerome. St. Jerome is often pictured with a lion because of a story that grew up around him as being somebody who rescued a lion because the lion had a thorn in its paw. He took the thorn out of the lion's paw, and then they became besties after that. That probably never happened. I think it's pretty safe to say that it never happened, but it's a great story. It has kind of an Aesop flavor to it. So St. Jerome is often portrayed with a lion which is not the same as the winged lion, which tells you you're looking at St. Mark. I mentioned St. Jerome because he is the person who translated the Bible out of Greek and out of Hebrew to the version that most people were using throughout the Middle Ages that we commonly call the Vulgate Bible. So if you're ever trying to look at a version of the Bible that people were using back in the Middle Ages, you're looking at the Vulgate. The Vulgate Bible was commissioned by the Pope He asked Jerome to translate it for the people. And so St. Jerome, of course, he did a lot of commentary about it. He was extremely knowledgeable in order to do this translation, in order to be asked to do this translation. So St. Jerome is thought of as one of the church fathers. Along with Jerome is St. Augustine. St. Augustine is often depicted with a heart, a flaming heart, especially that's pierced with an arrow. And this is how he is represented today most often. This is because St. Augustine was a guy who was very sinful by his own recounting as a young man, and then he became a real believer and became a real biblical scholar. He was somebody who wrote a lot of works around Christianity in the Bible, including the city of God. So he is somebody whose heart was pierced by the love of God, and then it became full of flames in that he had a lot of zeal, and a lot of feeling about Christianity. So you can recognize St. Augustine if you see a flaming heart. In the category of people that are not in the Bible, not church fathers, and whose backgrounds we don't really know a lot about, we have a lot of the female saints. An important one is St. Anne, who is said to be the mother of Mary, as in the Virgin Mary. 
Anne is depicted as a grandmotherly figure, very supportive of Mary. She has become the patron saint of women in labor. So representing that work that women do for other women, especially relatives and mothers. What's interesting to me about St. Anne is you often see St. Anne with a book. And it doesn't mean that she's written a book necessarily like Paul, but she is somebody who taught Mary to read. This is something that we see a lot in medieval art. So it's interesting to see a female saint like Anne with a book. And often you will see the Virgin Mary with a book as well. Along the same lines, we have all of the Virgin Saints. And the Virgin Saint stories are very, very similar in lots of different ways. But you can tell the difference between them because of their iconography. So, of course, the most popular of these is probably Catherine. Catherine's symbol is the wheel. And the wheel was a torture device, which was the one on which she was meant to be broken for her martyrdom. In the story, Catherine touches the wheel and it breaks. So instead of breaking her on the wheel, she breaks the wheel. So a Catherine wheel is something that you can find all over medieval art. She was a very, very popular saint. She is also the patron saint of Carter's. So you can see how the iconography lends itself to things like patronage as a saint. Incidentally, Catherine wheels are also a really popular type of firework. So if you see a firework and you're like, why is this called a Catherine wheel? Now you know it's a throwback to a saint who was meant to be broken on the wheel, but was not. We also have St. Margaret. St. Margaret is the one who appears with a dragon. And St. Margaret was eaten by a dragon because she was refusing the advances of, I believe, another emperor who was trying to both convert her and marry her. Of course, she wasn't into that being a good virginal Christian. So she was eaten by a dragon, but she invoked the name of Jesus and burst out of the dragon's stomach, killing him. So if you see a beautiful woman emerging from the stomach of a dragon in a particularly gruesome way, this is St. Margaret, and she is appropriately the saint of childbirth, the patron saint of childbirth. When I was talking about birth girdles with Sarah Fittiment, Last year, we were talking about prayers to St. Margaret. She was somebody who was invoked quite a lot by women in childbirth who wanted to feel safer with the intercession of St. Margaret. Other virgin martyrs who you may or may not have heard of are Lucy, who gouged out her own eyes or had her eyes gouged out as part of her torture on the way to martyrdom. Agatha, who had her breasts cut off. And like Lucy, you will see her with these body parts actually served up on a platter in many medieval images. So there's something. Now you may not be able to forget this image of St. Agatha. And also Ursula, who was a virgin who was also martyred. She might be depicted with a whole bunch of other virgins who she shielded under her cloak. While we're talking about these important women saints who were super, super meaningful to the women of the Middle Ages, if not a lot of women today, is that one of the most recognizable saints today, St. Joan of Arc, was actually not a saint in the Middle Ages because it was really tricky, the case of Joan. She was tested and she was said to be somebody who was receiving revelations, true revelations from God. And then she was put on trial and said to be someone who was not receiving true revelations from God. So it was very tricky for anyone to actually say she was a saint. It really depended on which side of the war you were on. So just FYI, St. Joan of Arc is revered as a saint today, but she was not canonized until 1920. Continuing on with saints whose stories are interesting and important, especially to the nations of medieval Europe, but whose background we can't actually pin down all that well historically, we have the patron saint of England, St. George, who was the person who was supposed to have slain a dragon, who was probably meant to be Satan in the story. And we have St. Denis, who is an important saint, patron saint of France, who was martyred on Montmartre, so the Mount of Martyrs. He was said to have been beheaded there and to have picked up his head and walked to the place where his cathedral is now sitting. And you can learn more about the Cathedral of St. Denis in a previous episode I did talking about cathedrals. 
Perhaps the most interesting to me of these saints that is really ubiquitous and has been for hundreds of years, but we are not quite sure about the background of, is St. Christopher. St. Christopher is the patron saint of travelers. His name means the Christ carrier, and there is a story of him being the person who carries a child across a river, who he later finds out is the Christ child. But in Old English, there is a story of St. Christopher that is actually older than this, in which he is a dog-headed saint. He basically looks like Egyptian statues of Anubis, and he comes from the land of dog-headed people and becomes a Christian and starts to convert people. And of course, the story is similar. He gets into trouble with an emperor. He gets tortured. He gets martyred. So St. Christopher is both a regular person or a giant who is carrying the Christ child across the river, or he is represented as having a dog head. So if you do see a very strange saint in Christian iconography from the Middle Ages, and he's got a dog's head, he looks more like an Egyptian god, this is actually St. Christopher. I think this is a really interesting story. I came across it when I was studying Old English as an undergraduate, and it's just stuck with me ever since then. I just think it's a really interesting story. Then we come to the saints who are real people, documented real people. And I'm mentioning a few of them because I think that they are important to understanding the Middle Ages and important saints today. There are lots of schools and churches and even monastic orders named after them. So let's start with St. Benedict, who became somebody I knew pretty well when I was writing How to Live Like a Monk, even though this is a book I don't think he liked very much at all because... I love to laugh and make jokes, and St. Benedict was not about that. So St. Benedict, you may remember, was born in Nursia. He was an abbot, even though he was a very reluctant abbot, until people tried to poison him, and then he moved along and ended up founding another monastery. He wrote the Benedictine Rule, which was the rule for monasticism that people are still following today, and that people followed even with tweaks and revisions most of the time in the Middle Ages. He might be depicted as being somebody with a book. He might be depicted as being somebody with a chalice and some bread, but they are poisoned because one time somebody tried to poison St. Benedict in real life. So you sometimes will see a seal of St. Benedict that has a poisoned chalice, poisoned bread on it, and perhaps a raven rescuing him from eating these things. What I didn't realize when I wrote How to Live Like a Monk is that St. Benedict, in addition to being a very important figure in terms of creating a culture of monasticism, he was also designated in 1964 by Pope Paul VI to be the patron saint of all of Europe. That's something that I think that St. Benedict would probably be pretty conflicted about in that he might feel quite proud about it and then feel bad about feeling proud about it. But there it is, St. Benedict the patron saint of Europe. A more recognizable figure, perhaps, if you're walking by someone's garden, is St. Francis. St. Francis being somebody who is usually surrounded by animals. Again, he was a real person. He was a rich son who decided to give up his wealth and live in poverty and preach. And you see him preaching to animals a lot of the time. There are still many services in which people are allowed to bring their pets to church and have them blessed in the name of St. Francis. So you will recognize St. Francis because he's often surrounded by animals. He might have stigmata because this was a vision that he had of being blessed with stigmata. You might also recognize St. Francis because his belt might have three knots in it, representing poverty, chastity, and obedience. Of course, St. Francis is the patron of the Franciscan Order of Friars, the people who in the Middle Ages would be traveling around and preaching. Then we have St. Dominic, who is a contemporary of St. Francis. He is usually represented by a black and white dog who has a torch in its mouth. And this refers to a vision that Dominic's mother had before he was born, of a black and white dog carrying a torch that lit up the world. Dominic might also be represented by a star because of a vision that his grandmother was said to have had when he was baptized of a star on his forehead. So you might see St. Dominic represented by a dog with a torch or a star. Dominic being the founder of the Dominican Order of Friars, who were educated men 
who made sure that people were following the doctrine of Christianity in the method prescribed by the church. So they were often found in black and they were often the friars who were involved in inquisition because they were really trying to make sure that everybody was following Christianity to the letter as they understood it as educated friars. And I'm going to end with St. Martin of Tours, a bishop who was a real person, again, who was said to have been really generous with beggars. And he is celebrated on November 11th, which is called Martin Mass. So if you ever come across Martin Mass in your readings, this is November 11th, which we recognize more often these days, instead of being the celebration of St. Martin, being a celebration of the end of World War I. So Remembrance Day here in Canada, Armistice Day elsewhere. So St. Martin of Tours, another person who you can recognize because he's often seen with wine, because his feast day happens near the end of the harvest. So Martin Mass, kind of a precursor to what North Americans celebrate as Thanksgiving. Martin Mass being a time of harvest where people are getting ready for the winter and perhaps celebrating with a bit of wine. So I hope you've enjoyed this quick beginner's guide to saints. It's something that I remember becoming interested in when I was first given a tour of St. Giles's Cathedral in Edinburgh. I was about 20 and not having grown up in the Catholic tradition, I didn't know how to recognize saints. And it occurred to me that we talk about saints so much in terms of the culture of the Middle Ages that perhaps you two needed just a quick guide to recognizing them when you see them. So hopefully the next time you drive past a stained glass window or walk past it, or you take a tour of a cathedral or a church, you'll have a better idea of who you're looking at and what their stories meant. And maybe it'll be Another entry point into understanding the culture of the Middle Ages. If you're interested in saints, there has been so much work done on it, and you can really find it anywhere looking at medieval studies. And I really encourage you to dig deep into these stories of the saints because they were not only very important to the culture, but they're still really interesting today, whether you follow a religious tradition or you're just somebody who's interested in stories from the past. Before we go, here's Peter from Medievalist.net to tell us what's on the website. What's up, Peter? Hey, hey. Well, the first thing I want to tell you about is this beautiful timber-framed house that was discovered in Wakefield, England. Right in the city center is a heritage building. It's kind of used as a pub. But what they did was, in the renovations, they took off all the cement that was on it. And it revealed this old frame of a, of a building on it, which was really just kind of amazing to see. It's kind of this wonderful picture to share. So awesome. uh, so we got that. I always like having pieces about the medieval world outside of Europe. So we have some fun stuff this week. Jack Wilson, who's our Mongols expert, has a piece on Chinggis Khan and the myth of having him having red hair and green eyes. <laughs> So, I actually don't know that myth, so I'll have to I, have a look at I, this. I didn't know too much about it, but apparently a lot of historians are saying, oh, he's got red hair, or he's got green eyes. And he takes a look at like how he kind of developed, which is really just mistranslations, right? Yeah. So we have that. We have Adam Alley also has a piece on a 7th century rebellion against the Umiads, and I am doing a piece on five things you can learn from a ninja. <laughs> awesome. That is going to be my next read for sure. <laughs> I want to know what a ninja can teach me. I'm oh, all man. about it. And none of these things involve weapons. I'm hoping it'll be all about stealth. <laughs> indeed, indeed. And, and stuff like what time it is. <laughs> That's unexpected. <laughs> Ask a ninja what time it is. That sounds like the setup for a joke. Or how they can find your password. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah. I think we all need to read this one because heaven knows we have a lot of passwords these days. <laughs> helpful hints, helpful hints. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Peter. That sounds like an awesome bunch of articles. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, as always, to all of the patrons on Medievalist.net's Patreon page. Your patronage supports this podcast, as well as other work by independent medieval historians, writers, and podcasters. In addition to seriously good karma, patrons have access to all sorts of great stuff like subscriptions to the Medieval Magazine and Medieval World Magazine, as well as ad-free versions of this podcast. To get in on the action, please visit patreon.com slash medievalists. For everything from saints to sinners, follow medievalist.net on Facebook or Twitter at medievalists. 
You can find me, Danielle Sabalski, on social media at 5MIN Medievalist or 5 Minute Medievalist. And you can find my books at all your favorite bookstores where you can get hold of How to Live Like a Monk, Medieval Wisdom for Modern Life, in hardcover, ebook, and audiobook. Our music is Beyond the Warriors by Geefrog. Thanks for listening, and have yourself an amazing day. Music